Welcome everyone. I'm Nora Shabazi. I am the founder of EBLI, Evidence-Based Literacy Instruction. And I am here today with David Chalk um, for our third episode of talking to him after um, his reading instruction. It is now November, 2022. I taught David to read back in May of 2021 for the documentary, The Truth About Reading. Um, and so what I recommend, if this is your first time seeing a, a video of David, that you go back and you look at the Truth About Reading um, official trailer. And then episode one that we did was called um, It Was Hell. That's actually the name of, of what you know David's message really was six months after he learned to read. And about six months after that, we did another one. And it, he, uh, that one you can find, it's called Emerging from Hell. But David had said, you know, I really want to talk about this evolution that happens after you learn to read. And I think we should do um, another, you know, another interview so I can share a little bit. So uh, just last week, David and I were in Detroit for a private screening of The Truth About Reading. It was the second time for both of us to see the movie. It had been shown twice at that point. And it was quite a you know, I don't even know how to explain it, quite something. And, and it will not be available publicly for people until well into 2023, um, but it's at, it, it will be at film festivals and private screenings until then. So anyway, David, um, you had some really profound remarks, in my opinion, after that, that movie to, to the audience there. And so I don't know if you wanna start there with, with sharing or just take it away and, and share what you'd like to share. Nora, thank you again for having me on. I, um, my life has changed so much since I met you a little over a year and a half ago. And when we were just talking at the Detroit screening that was actually um, part of um, the General Motors sponsorship of helping put it together, I was blown away. Um, I think for me, truly watching the documentary, having the opportunity to see it in a pre-screening for the second time. The first time, literally, I was like this. Um, I, I, it was a lot of anxiety for me. There was a lot coming out and, and seeing it the second time, I really got the gravity of the situation. And what really, what really stuck with me is the message behind the documentary and the term, the reading wars. Nora, what, what are the reading wars? I, I, I got that it, it is about all of these different ways of teaching children to read in school. But I want to know, how did it ever come about? Well, for really a very long time, many, many decades. <laughs> you know, some people say back into the 20s and 30s, and even before that, actually, in the 1900s, um, that there have been two philosophical um, perceptions or ways of delivering reading instruction out there. And, and one is called traditional phonics, um, which is phonics that most people know with the rules and long and short vowels and, you know, two vowels go walk and the first one does the talking, that type of thing. So starting with uh, phonics instruction there. And the other one is, it has been called a variety of things as is traditional phonics, but it's um, whole language. Now it's called balanced literacy. And that's the philosophy that we want kids to learn to read by reading, by exposing them to books and getting them a lot of exposure to that and really not to worry about sounding out the words so much or making that, you know, de-emphasizing that um, tremendously. So those two factions truly have been at each other's throats for decades. And a lot of the focus and time and energy, um, you know, in politics even, definitely in education, have been in fighting about that. And in the 25 years since I've been doing this, it, those wars, when people have said, oh, the reading wars are over, I'm like, oh, wait a minute, you, are, I don't know where you're at, but you're not in education because we're in schools and all of that all the time. And they've actually escalated. And lots of, what it is, is the focus is on the adults and their perceptions and that type of thing, and not on the kids and, and what's working for them. So those are really what the reading wars are about. I got into, thank you, Nora, because to me, it makes no sense. I understand because parents and the adults are involved and they want the best for their children and they certainly don't want them to go what I and John and other people in the documentary went through. But in a recent interview, I asked the interviewer who had a learning disabled or dyslexic child that was having difficulty reading, I asked her, what is it you really want? 
why are you putting all this time in? And of course, her answer was to help me read. But I said, you know what? It's actually deeper than that. What is it that you truly want for your child? And you know what the answer is? Joy and peace. And that is what we do not have in our lives when we cannot read. And that is why I asked you about the reading wars, because it is so sad. I look at the world I live. I live in a world of high tech. I've been in it for 30 years. And technology has programming and coding and languages and all sorts of things we have to do to in order to understand and create new technology ahead. Of course, reading is involved in that, but I'm looking at the bigger picture. If we treated technology coding and operating systems the way we treated how to read or the coding for reading, we would be nowhere with technology. We probably wouldn't have even gone to the moon in 69. And the reason I say that is in technology, we allow the next great thing to come forward, supersede and supplant what was there before. We hold nothing back. We call it open source. Meaning we don't stand on the, in a place and say, we've got it this way for so long, we've spent this many millions or billions of dollars on it, and until we get the right evidence and proof and enough studies and blah, 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 you know, I, I don't have all the language for that, Nora. We aren't changing. And it's been that way for 50 or 80 years. Well, you know, in the computer industry, if something is six months, it's had a pretty long life. And when we look at what's happened in the computing industry in the last... 20, 30, even five years, new technologies like blockchain and new operating systems and Android and iOS and Windows. Look at DOS going from going from DOS to Windows. Hundreds of millions of dollars were in, in, in invested in that. People had to learn for years how to use it and, and how to work with it and be trained in it. But at no point did anyone's ego ever get in the way to say that we aren't changing because of all the money we spent on the prior operating system. It is completely free to move forward. And what I'm trying to say after going through all of this and understanding what is happening in the marketplace, I said this early in my first interview, I had to get out of my way. Well, you know what we all have to do? We have to get out of the way of the systems that are out there that we use to try and get people to read. Because if we don't continue to evolve and let the old systems go and let new possibilities supersede them, we are going to have this problem continuously. Nor I know the statistic is in the documentary, but what, what is the, the low literacy rate in America right now? Well, for fourth grade that just came out about a month ago, we have 67% um, of fourth graders are not proficient in reading in the United States, and 68% of eighth graders are not. I'm dumbfounded. Do you know, in, in my industry in technology, if we had any sort of failure rate like that, with new technology going out, no one would ever use it. The reason it works so well in what we do is we all work together. Open source technology means everyone helps everyone and they accept if the technology they have made is now not the best and most current, but they provide that leeway, they provide that passageway to get to the next level. And you named you know, some of the, the, the technologies that have been around for you, I call them technology, because the systems that have been around for years, and that's what I saw in this thing called the reading wars. Why are we locked on the way we teach? Why are we locked on the way that we think children have to learn? Because my question to you, Nora, is in all the methodologies that have been out there, how is that working? Not well. Not well. <laughs> we haven't been above 60% proficient since the 1970s when they first started doing the test. And we've actually are getting worse. So yeah, the something. And really the reading wars where parents are involved some, they don't really know about that. It's mostly amongst educators. Yes. Well, Whoever it is in my industry, that would be the programmers, that would be the developers, and of course, parents wouldn't be involved. So I still state my case that we need to look at science, we need to look at evidence, and we need to move forward, and we need to let go of our old beliefs that just because we've done it that way, we don't keep doing it that way. And Nora, that's what you showed me, because prior to coming to you, I don't know what the systems were, but a few 
situations had occurred when there were ways I could possibly be taught to read. And one of those happened in my latter years of high school. And it was an absolute failure. In fact, I felt worse after having gone through it. I felt my self-esteem drop. And that's what I want to talk about when I said a few minutes ago about what we really want for our children when we give them the ability to read and comprehend. We are opening their mind to love, peace, and joy. And I'm not trying to say that in such a way that it, it's a woo-woo thought about it. What I'm saying is, if we don't feel good inside of ourselves, we are going to have challenges in life. Look at the United States, one of the greatest nations on earth with one of the highest incarceration rates of people. Many of those people have learning disabilities or have dyslexia. It is not that they set out to be criminals. It is such that their self-esteem and their self-worth went down the toilet. When we go into the jails, and you see some of that in the documentary, as soon as those people start to feel good about themselves, the possibility in their life changes completely. So my thought for this, Nora, this, this is what I plead with parents, and I plead with educators, and I plead with anyone who has their hand in the pie of educating children. Look at what is possible. We need to find a way to help children feel good at a very young age. Let me just go back and look at my life from the very beginning. Sure, I went into school thinking I would be able to read. Very shortly after that, I started falling behind because the way the system works in uh, memorization and, and the rules that you have to learn doesn't necessarily work for a dyslexic mind. So I start to fall behind. When I started to fall behind, my self-esteem goes down, my self-worth goes down. Then I'm not called upon in the classroom. And then, as I told you, other children started bullying me. That may not be as common today, but in when I went to school, it was. If my learning had started in such a way, my dyslexic mind could have taken it in, I would have been on par with other children, and none of that would have happened. And Nora, I've heard you say the term now, say, spell, read. And that's the most perfect natural way that anyone could ever learn to read because it's nature. We know how to speak. We've been speaking for millions of years. Writing and reading came in only hundreds of years ago. The reason being is we needed to communicate what we were saying. And in doing that, we coded it onto paper. That was then... The next step would be requiring reading to lift it off the paper. So again, I can sort of correlate it to the computer industry. When we have an idea for a piece of software, we code it first into the computer or onto the paper, and then we lift it off. By running the application, it's as if we read it. So if we were to teach children to come from speech, to learn to encode onto paper, spell it out, the reading would come naturally. I thought of something the other day that, you know, again, had my mind just spin. I now, I'm doing so many things like reading every day, enjoying every day. I've got so much room in my mind to enjoy life that I'm starting to learn the guitar. Nora, really? you know. Yeah. Yes. And for me, would I ever have thought of doing that? Because I looked at some of the facts about learning to pay, play the guitar. Okay, in, in English, we have 26 letters in the alphabet, and I believe we have 44 sounds. And in a few of those, we have multiple ways, especially multiple ways of laying them out on paper and coding yeah. them on paper. And the guitar, there are more than 4,000 recognized chords. There are thousands and thousands of sounds and notes that can come out of a guitar. Not only do you have to learn to play the guitar, you have to learn to read the music. And if you're going to get good at it, you have to learn to encode it on paper to write the music. Nora, I can tell you that just picking up the guitar and starting to learn it, in, to me, a hundred times harder than what you taught me in learning to read. 26 letters, 44 sounds, a couple of different ways of spelling, I can accomplish that very quickly. Now I'm tackling something massive, playing an instrument that has millions of permutations in it, but I'm tackling it because I have the confidence to know 
that when there's a code, when there's a system, and in music, there is a beautiful code and a beautiful system, and everyone agrees upon it. What we have to do in reading is continue to move forward, get out of the way of all the technologies and systems that have been there for a long time, and come to the best, a combination of everything, if it may be. But what I can tell you, probably the most important thing, if a dyslexic mind can find a way or be taught a way through, say, say, spell, read, it would only accentuate and accelerate the reading of every other child. And if we can have children reading at a young age where we don't have to do intervention and we don't have to go back and do what you had to do to me, before the mind is damaged, before the self-esteem falls down, we've done all we need to do because that is what we really want to do for children. So, Nora, what I see, what, what has come out of this for me, and as I've told you in every interview we've done, my life changed. But oh my God, has my life changed now that my mind is free. For children, for any parent, for any educator, let's do what we can for them as early as possible so they don't get the trauma in their mind. Nora, how often? We all do it. But the average person, it is said, 95% of all the chatter and talk in their head is negative. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sure you experience it as well, too. Yep. Well, for a child like me, it was 99.999%. There was no room to read after that. And there was certainly no room for comprehension. That's what it comes down to at the end of the day. If we can do the best we can to have a child feel good about themselves, have them not fall behind in the beginning, that chatter does not take up all the space in their head, the negativity. And with that, as the education and reading start to go in, the child has the room to comprehend, and that is what it is about. Because when I first sat down with you and you had me read a few pages, between the chatter in my head of negativity that I can't do this and I can't read, trying to memorize, pull from memory what the words were, I had no mental capacity left to comprehend. As soon as I started to understand a methodology, a coding or decoding from the paper, it was beautiful because now I had the ability in my mind to actually take in and appreciate what I was reading. I know yeah. <laughs> that's exciting. It sounds, you know, it sounds crazy. And people who can read and have done this naturally may or may not understand. But what is so important is that we don't have the children fall behind. We don't take years to do studies from from where I stand an outsider looking at this, methodologies of say, spell, read are the answer that could change lives here and around the world, Nora. I want, you know, and it's interesting what you say too, because so many bright kids, even when they're told you're doing well, when they know the expectations have been lowered and they're doing mm -hmm. much less than the other kids, they realize. So it's not that extrinsic, oh, you're doing a good job. It's that intrinsic Look at me reading, you know, these books and, and that type of thing, changing that. But it's been fun. It's just so fun for me. You know, I only see you every few months when we're at these things or whatever. But every time you're a different human, it's like you're remade again. Or I don't oh. even know. And I want to know that I don't even know. when we talked six months ago to now, as far as, you know, every time there's a it's an incremental growth in all mm -hmm. kinds of things. You know, the guitar was a new that's pretty amazing too, by the mm -hmm. way. Um, you know, a lot of people are taught to read music by memorizing it, just like memorizing words for English, which means you can only play. You can only go so far. Yeah, you can't do that. But mm -hmm. I want to know, since we spoke, you know, six months ago, what is, you know, I know you've told me about, oh, I'm, you're almost obsessed with reading and you're mm -hmm. reading many books at a time. Can you share a little bit about that? Well, I got a pile of books. They're here beside me. They're in the living room. They're on my nightstand. And people say, well, that's, you know, he, he's just going over the top. I'm not. I crave reading. I, I, I enjoy it so much because I am, I'm in the language of the book when I read it because I have the space in my mind to take it in and absorb it. Something that happened on the trip when I flew to Detroit, I had a screaming and I was telling a friend of mine, I packed something that I have never packed in my life. I packed a book in my suitcase 
And I actually read it on the plane. And if if someone had seen that, you know, a year a year ago, they would think I was just faking. I'd probably be holding the book upside down. But it it is incredible. And I'll take it a step further because I actually came back with two books. And this story, I think you'll like it, Nora. Um, I had the opportunity to give a brief summary after the documentary because it meant so much to me and and me seeing myself in the documentary and seeing the evolution in such a short period of time and i know there will be a lot of naysayers but nora we documented that over a five-day period from the day i walked in there until the day i walked out and everything you see and hear now is from those five days and while all the video may not end up in the documentary. It is somewhere on the cutting room floor. And if anyone ever wants to question it or challenge me on it or not believe what I went through, I'm here to tell the truth about it. And I would gladly stand in front of Congress. I would stand in front of any legislators. I would stand in front of anyone and show them what happened and give them the outcome of my life. But this is what happened after the screening of the documentary. I told everyone, and it was the first time I had ever said it, that for the first time in my life, with the negativity, and for those who watched that first video, as I told you before, Nora, if we hadn't filmed that first video when we did, I could never do it because that is not me anymore. What changed so much for the first time ever, I could say I love myself. And I had so much anger and despise and loathing in me because what my mind was doing to me about who I wasn't and what I couldn't do, that I wouldn't be free. And after that, watching that screening, I had this feeling come over me of when I said, now I think I'm on the other side, I'm free. And I said that now in reading, absorbing and understanding everything, I welcome books into my life. And that is when the serendipitous event happened the next day. I was out looking around Detroit, it was a wonderful time. People were so friendly. I was out on a scooter with a friend, Christine, and we decided we were gonna to go to the Motown original house and um, brought it up and we get there and we go in, and we're told there's an hour and a half wait. So we decided we were gonna spend the day going around, but we were gonna look in the uh, gift store. Christine wanted to buy a t-shirt and I was looking, I couldn't see anything I wanted to buy. And up at the counter while she's paying, there's a stack of books about the history of Motown. And these books are you know, good, solid, thick books, hundreds of pages. And I'm sure it was 30 or $40 for the book. And seriously, I picked the book up, which I would never do. And I'm opening the book and I'm reading just the, the preface of the book. And the lady behind the counter says to me, would you like that book? And I said, well, I'm just flipping through it. She goes, no, would you like the book? And I go, what do you mean? She goes, it's your lucky day. You can have it. We're giving those books away today. Nora, it may not sound significant. That's the first time I've ever really picked up a book in a store. It's the first time I was actually reading a little bit of the introduction because I felt like I wanted to know what it was about. And the universe through that lady handed me the book for free. I went home that day with two books in my bag. Have you read any of it yet? I have, and it's absolutely amazing. I the know, things- I'll borrow it from you. I oh, I'll it. bring it with me next time, Nora. But that's my life. Uh, serendipitous events, changes in my life, new people I'm meeting. Uh, you know, I, I, I hadn't had a significant other person in my life for a number of years. After having the confidence to go back out and feel the changes in my life, somebody popped into my life, a new person that if I'd have been looking, I would have never found anyone, but just the reliefs of the pressure and the, the self-worth and self-esteem that have come back to me over the last year and a half, truly from reading, changed everything. And I was open to all new possibility. That's so amazing. Wow. Oh my goodness. Congratulations. That's all. It's so fun. Thank you, Nora. Yeah, you, it's just, you're so I fun to talk head. to because your excitement is just contagious. Mm. Which It's is, real. I know. Nora, it's Keep real. I love happy. it. For sure. I want to know what's your favorite book you've been, you know, in the last months that you've read. I would say it had a lot to do with coming back from where I was. And um, the book is The Untethered Soul mm. by um, Michael Singer. Mm -hmm. And look at that. I can actually remember the name of the book. <laughs> and the author. I'm impressed. And the author. 
-hmm. It is a beautiful book that has much of what I, I needed to understand why I had found this space in my head to be free and relax, wash out all of that story in it was hell until I was 62. It's gone, Nora. And that book explains how we can release pain when we start to understand who we are. And you gave me that, Nora. That documentary was far more than me learning to read. It was far more than me willing to risk going on camera and showing people the, the fear and what I felt was humiliating to have people see my inability to read and be an adult, but to come through it and come out the other side and to still not understand what it would really mean. Of course, I want to read. I love it. But what does it mean to have to really be able to read and have the confidence? Nora, it was a gift that you and John and everyone in that documentary gave me that I can never repay. And if I have any way to repay it, it will be to spend the purpose of my life now helping children, parents, teachers, and educators understand what we can do to give that gift to children right out of the gate. That's pretty amazing. You know, and another th piece of your story that I really find fascinating and exciting to follow, you know, regularly with this connection with the, with the documentary is that um, the evolution of you, you know, you're at, 12 months ago, you were at one place and then tw six months later. And then, I mean, you're constantly evolving. And I know, like you said about your creativity, you've always been tremendously creative. Mm -hmm. You've invented all kinds of things and had all kinds of businesses and all that type of thing. But that's even, you know, exploded too. It just seems like every angle, it's just, it's so fun to listen to you come from all of these different perspectives of your life and what has happened with it. I, in the documentary, when people have the opportunity, and I encourage them so much to watch it when it is available, John's life and Dan Cochran, one of the other people that was interviewed, along with others in the documentary, when I truly understand the gravity of subpar or subliteracy in a person's life, we say, well, maybe they read two or three grade levels, but where below where they should be. As I said earlier, the gravity is far greater than that. The loss of self-esteem and self-worth has people whose lives could be magic and absolutely full of joy lose out on that because what they do to themselves. Reading is the gateway to joy and peace, Nora, is what I would say. Because without it, we cannot achieve inner love. Sure, sure. What I had, Nora, in all those 62 years, I had a lot of happiness in my life. But what I learned in the reading I have done and what I've found internally now, that happiness is filling a hole in ourselves with external things and putting up walls. I need that car. I need that house. I need that money. I need that person. I need that job. I need this. When joy is what we have inside of us when we don't need anything. And reading filled that hole. All of those things that I achieved, not that they weren't wonderful things and not that I wouldn't like to have many of those. And I'm not telling anyone not to follow your dreams, but I am putting this out there that if you want your children to live the most fulfilled, peaceful, joyous life, don't have them crave an outside world that has to adjust to fit them. Let them find it on the inside. And I can assure you that reading and literacy are the gateway to peace and joy in life. That's pretty profound, David, and wonderful. You know, I think about like this documentary, we know there's a lot of facets to it. We're in there for this piece and, and such, but, um, you know, it's very comprehensive, I think, from you looking at the literacy landscape from a lot of ways that nobody's looked at it before that I've seen anyway, and also looking at it from people like you that are significantly successful from everybody's point of view, and many of you, you know, you and Molly and Dan and, and John and, you know, Cameron and everybody. And, and yeah, everyone. And, yeah, I mean, there's just all kinds of people that are uh, 
Cody, they're all of them basically. Mm -hmm. And, um, and also then we've got the ones that end up in jail, the people who end up in jail and, and on that same trajectory, I'm gonna lose my train of thought here. But um, so the fact that all everything of that us, was in the documentary, you were yeah, talking about. No, the thing of it is, is that all of us, and all, most of us don't know it, but all of us have someone who's dear to us, who is going through that inner anguish that you are mm -hmm. going through. And, you know, just recently last, you know, the last few weeks have come out that Sold a Story podcast. Have you listened to any of that? The Sold a oh, Story? Yeah. Yeah, um, that, you know, talks about teacher, you know, it's kind of escalating the reading war some because it's calling out some very hard truths that have happened. But I think that you are just the epitome of what is possible. And at 62 years old and being willing to have yourself filmed. I remember when Nick said, we need to have an adult that's willing to let you teach them read. And I'm like, mm, you could ask me for a unicorn and that'd be easier because <laughs> we're not going to get that. Yeah. And the fact that you did it and you, you know, it was just such a, and that it's all on film and, and that whole thing gives. So, you know, if you could learn to read at 62, you could have learned at five. Yeah. And to me, that's a huge message that we need to get these kids when they're coming in, we need to get teachers what they need. We need to get kids what they need to lift up society, not just mm -hmm. each person, of course, but society as a whole and to avoid so much of this anguish, you yeah. know, and shame uh, that people like you and Cameron and John and Dan and Molly and Cody and Ann and everybody are feeling so deeply and it has taken these 18 months. That's what I see. It's almost like you're releasing that, that shame, yes. that, you know, all of all of those types of things. So it's, it, you know, people don't look at the trauma as much as it needs to be looked at, in my opinion. The trauma, nor the trauma is it, because I am sure many people who will watch this video, even those that are helping their children, have suffered in silence themselves. Mm -hmm. And what I want to say to them is this, is what people have said to me, David, you lived a pretty good life. You were successful. And that's because I had the support of my mom, which, you know, you learn in the early videos that her lifting up to the best she could of my self-esteem and self-worth made it such that I could, I could get through life and I could do wonderful things, but it's not enough to live an amazing life. And the difference that I found in that after learning to read was, yes, that was happiness much of the time, but there's a magical difference to when you get to joy and peace inside of you. And that's what we have to do. For adults, it is possible. You can learn to read. This can happen to you. You're seeing an expedited version through me because I crave it. Once Nora gave me this gift, I wanted to see everything that could come out of it. Not everyone has to do that. I'm just passionate to do it. But you can live the life you want. You can have the peace inside of you that you want. And if we can prevent children from having to go to 62 or prevent the remedial reading or the systems that have to come in place when they're in grade four, five, six, and seven, the damage is already being done. It doesn't have to be permanent damage. We have to back up and say, yes, there are numerous systems we can use. But let's go back to the beginning and teach the teachers how to teach reading in such a way that the teachers love teaching it. I know every teacher I had wanted to teach me to read, but they didn't have the tools. Those tools are there. When I got interviewed the other day, Nora, and the interviewer said to me, well, it sounds amazing what's happened to you. And I, I'm very much interested in doing that for my son. So I think I better get trained in it and I better research it. And I better look at the, what do you call them? The peer reviews and everything. And I said, no, why don't you give your son that gift now? Find out how you can get him into a system of say, spell, read. Look at his face. Look at his eyes. And you will know you have done the right thing. It isn't for you to get in the way and study it for six months or a year. If you really want to help your child, help him now. And that goes to the educators and them to the teachers. Help the teachers have a system from the start that works. In the documentary, I know when it comes up on the screen and I go from sort of day one to day two and day three, there were gasps. Did you hear them in oh, the yeah. audience, Nora? Yeah. It's real. I've got goosebumps right now. Yeah, 
watching it, I'm wondering how many times, as I said to you, how many times do you have to watch this before? I don't know. I mean, we weren't the only ones in there. There's 150 people that were all speechless and in tears it, because it's profound. I mean, all yeah. of it is profound. You know, the biggest thing that I think that you said that I really want to latch on to is I'm free. You know, yeah. subliteracy and, you know, functional literacy, illiteracy is a form of slavery. It is a form of slavery and you're not free. And to me, that is the biggest thing of all. And we can get our kids all to be free, you know, from the beginning, but you, and then having all of these u- unique perspectives, but gosh, joy. Yeah. And being free. Yeah. What a great idea. That's, you know, what, what's not to like about that? What, um, what parent wouldn't want that for their child? So I, In this system, I know there is peer research that has to be done. There are studies. There are all sorts of things that take months and years and millions of dollars. But why don't we do the right thing? Why don't we start in certain places, in certain sectors, in certain regions, in certain school districts, start to apply the new methodology, the science of reading, and look at the results. If you want a survey or a study, look at me. I was willing to do it. And those results are real and they are there and everyone's going to have the opportunity to see. That's a great idea. Somebody could look at your. Yeah. Give them all the footage, Nora. Give them the footage from beginning to end. And there's your damn study. And in there is the suffering that every child will go through because that is not looked at at its entirety. Of course, there will be no sayers. But Nora, you've, you've witnessed what's happened in my life. Yes, I'm an adult and I know how to deal with it better. But my God. Think if we gave that ability to children through the education and the teachers out of the gate, what a wonderful world. It would be possible. You know, you've been bit by the bug, David. This Mm -hmm. is the problem. When you get bit by this literacy bug, it's like there's no turning back, even if you want to. So you're on this path. and, And it's so exciting because I know that you are going to work to you know, oh, I'm, I'm to ensure other people get I'm doing whatever I can do. And I might even take it further, Nora. It isn't so much that I'm bitten by a bug. The mm-hmm. blinders came off. I will never understand all the language and the terminology and the systems that have to go through and everything that has been done to get us to the ability to teach children to read. But I'm saying treat this like we would in a modern day. That as we do technology, move it forward, give up the past, let go the money, the investment and the time that were put into old systems and move through to the new possibility as quick as we can. And if you want damn evidence, use me. <laughs> there you go. And we're going to get some others, too. We're, we're working on that. Well, your passion shines through. So if you could give a, I don't know, a summary sentence of, you know, in a nutshell, what you would like to convey to everybody as we end up here, what would that be? Well, it's how my mom got me through life as a child when she said, David, get out of your own way and you can do whatever you want. I now plead with parents and educators and administrators to get out of the way of a child's future by giving them everything you possibly can today and that is the most clear most beautiful thing you can give them in life the ability to read before the damage is done very good well thank you so much it's just always a pleasure to catch up with you with this for sure and we'll continue to who knows what's going to happen in six more months but yeah Mm. yeah this film will be out it's already going out last week to more people so well maybe uh, maybe i will be humiliated by the fact that people see how poor i was at reading and (laughs) that a person like that possibly change into what he's changed into but maybe they need to see it and that i think that's what's going to give me the next level the fact that we're talking and and they're hearing about how I've changed, but I want them to see it. Yeah. And they will. Mm. All right. Well, until what, what's our next month going to be and maybe in May at two years, Mm. we'll have to, we'll touch base again. Well, thank you. How beautiful it will be. Yes. I know. It's just so fun to keep seeing all of this unfolding of magnificent. So congratulations on everything, David, you're an inspiration, my dear. Thank you, Nora, John, and everyone involved in that documentary for giving me 
my life. You are welcome.